no mai hara mai e te whānau. Ko Waimakariri toku awa, ko Auraki toku maunga, ko Takitimu toku waka, ko Ngātahu toku iwi, ko Kaiwhakahari ahau ki Fertility New Zealand, ko Nicola Batossi ahau. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good evening. Welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. I'm Nicola Batossi, CEO of Fertility New Zealand, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Infertility is really stressful, incredibly stressful as it is, and we really appreciate that at the moment we're in COVID levels two and three, and that adds another layer um, to your lives and your experiences. So thank you for taking the time out tonight to join us. Webinars are one of our information offerings. You may have um, watched some of our information webinars last year during lockdown and um, after that. If you want to scroll through the recordings from last year, they're all available in the new section of our website. We have a range of information resources, uh, including our information leaflets uh, and videos available through our website. Um, we also host the Fertility Week campaign and we have an 0800 line, um, which is free of charge and supported by a panel of experts it can really help you navigate through your journey. So I encourage you to use that service. Our support is provided by a network of wonderful volunteers in 12 different centres around the country. They run support groups and events, uh, many of which are supported by um, closed Facebook groups or online meetings. And new people are always very welcome. Uh, we also provide advocacy, which is where we represent the voice of all New Zealanders wanting to create whānau. So tonight's uh, webinar on the very significant topic of male factor infertility um, will be presented by Dr Guy Goodex. Uh, he will give an overview of about 20 to 30 minutes of male factor infertility. Uh, there will then be the opportunity to ask questions by posting them into the chat box. So if you have a um, question, please post it in there to be answered live on screen. Dr. Goodex will also um, answer any general questions, but we will prioritize those uh, to do with male factor. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be available on our website and Facebook page um, in the coming days. So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight uh, Medical Director of Repromed Clinic in Auckland, Dr Guy Goodex. Um, kia ora, Nicola, and now I'm Mickey for that, um, that introduction and that um, welcome to us. Um, all and yeah, thanks for the opportunity to give a, an update on uh, male factor fertility, um, which as I'm going to outline is actually a, a common problem, um, sometimes an overlooked one. Um, and I'm very happy um, for the second half to answer questions really generally on, on fertility. Um, I thought I would start off just by outlining that sperm counts have actually declined over the last 70 or 80 years, particularly in the Western countries, and that's very well documented. And at the moment, the World Health Organization um, gives a guideline of over 15 million per mil for a normal count. But back in the 1970s, um, in fact, it was 30 million, and then it got tweaked down to 20 million and now 15. Um, and that, that overall decline in the Western world is a real thing. Um, and we know also that really once a count gets under about 20 million, even though that's still normal, there's definitely some impact on the time that it can take um, to conception. So this overall decline has resulted, I guess, in you know, more men falling into that, into that group. 
Uh, motility of the sperm is obviously very important. That's sometimes called the vitality. Um, and it's normal to have more than 32% combined um, progressive motility. In terms of shape, um, it's a little bit of a scary fact that, in fact, human sperm is actually reasonably abnormally shaped. And so you have to get up over about 96% abnormal shapes for it to be of some clinical significance. And probably has to be 99 or 100% abnormal shape before we think it actually has a significant impact. So of the patients that we see, um, about 40% of the time, um, a sperm issue is the cause. Um, and then if you if you um, combine a mild course with, you know, with other um, factors, in fact, about half of the couples that we see, half of the people that we see have some sort of male factor. Um, and it's really important to remember that when we investigate people, we don't just focus on one thing, because often there are multifactorial causes. And if there's a sperm issue, um, this can obviously lead to um, problems with fertilization. It's important to realize that even when the sperm count gets quite low, there is still a chance of spontaneous um, pregnancy. And so what we just about always factor in also is how long have a couple been trying? Um, have they been pregnant before? And obviously the age of the woman is really important. And so if you're 30 years old, Yes, it might take you three or four years to get pregnant if the sperm count's low, um, but you have got those three or four years usually. Whereas if the woman's approaching her mid to late 30s and ovarian reserve might be declining a bit, um, then there just isn't that same length of time for the um, lower sperm count to, to allow spontaneous pregnancy. So all of those factors are looked at and we interpret the analysis, um, you know, based on each individual person's circumstances. If the count's less than 5 million per mil, um, then there's a reasonable chance that pregnancy won't happen. Um, but again, you need to understand that sperm counts can be quite variable, and we would always want to see at least a couple of results if they're abnormal, um, because some studies from 20 or 30 years ago showed that a normal fertile man, the sperm count, can fluctuate actually quite significantly, um, you know, over a, over a year or two. Um, and so we wouldn't want to make too many um, decisions based on a single result. In terms of assessing um, a man's uh, fertility, um, semen analysis is obviously the first step. Um, and a lot of that can be undertaken through um, local community laboratories. So they have automated machines now that can give pretty accurate um, counts and also a pretty accurate assessment of motility. And then the fertility clinics do a more specialized um, assessment, for instance, something called anti-sperm antibodies, which may develop um, after surgery, like a vasectomy reversal or a hernia repair. Um, and anti-sperm antibodies can interfere with the motility of the sperm and also the way in which the sperm interacts with the egg. Um, and certainly if the sperm counts under 5 million per mil, um, then we'll go ahead and also do some other um, blood tests on the man, um, checking a karyotype, a chromosome check, um, excluding um, um, hormone levels, you know, problems in the pituitary, and things like that. Um, a detailed history is important, and we'll often pick up perhaps an operation as a teenager for a twisted testicle or an undescended testicle. Um, could be that there's a history of mumps um, with um, inflammation in the testicles, um, possibly a sporting injury. And we also take a work history um, just to look for occupational exposure to things. Um, and in terms of a physical examination, um, what we're specifically looking for is just the size and the consistency of the testes. Are they both present? And are there any abnormal swellings? And included in that would be something which I'll talk about a little bit later called a varicocele. Um, varicocele is usually left-sided, but not always. And it's like a varicose vein, but it's in the scrotum. They're reasonably common. Um, probably about 10% of men have a mild varicocele. And it's really only significant if it's symptomatic. So if you can um, get aching from it or swelling from it, and if any of the sperm parameters are abnormal. Um, so varicoceles can be palpated with the man standing up. 
and also we'll often get an ultrasound scan if we suspect a varicocele um, just to assess it uh, further. I wanted to say a word about um, male age because we talk a lot about um, female age and, and the reduction in ovarian reserve. Um, there's quite good evidence that, that when men get over about the age of 45, um, there's an impact on the um, DNA of the sperm and it can take a man over 45 um, longer to get their partner pregnant um, compared to a younger man and that's a pretty real thing. Um, and most clinics, for instance, will want um, a sperm donor um, who's under the age of 45 um, for exactly those reasons. There's also some quite um, interesting data about um, the effect of BMI. Um, and quite a big study came out of Adelaide um, about 10 years ago looking at the effect of um, significantly increased male BMI on IV out, IVF outcomes. Um, and again, there was concern raised about um, its relation with something called DNA fragmentation, so the genetic health of the sperm. Um, and as I'm going to mention towards the end, there's now a BMI criteria for men for publicly funded treatment. Um, so the BMI has to be under 40. Um, and that's just based on data that's really become fairly um, convincing over the last few years. So when we see men in clinic, um, particularly if there's a sperm um, concern, then we'll give lifestyle advice about um, reducing BMI. I want to say a word um, about the DNA of the sperm because it is, um, it is important. And there are some lifestyle modifications and um, I'll talk a little bit about antioxidant preparations that can make a difference to the DNA of the sperm. So obviously the DNA um, of the embryo comes from both the egg and the sperm. Um, and the DNA, if you like, is the, is the blueprint um, of life. We have a way of assessing um, sperm genetic health, and uh, it's particularly indicated where um, there are lifestyle factors that we feel may be impacting. Um, we'll often request it where there's been a history of recurrent miscarriage or recurrent implantation failure, and also where a couple do IVF um, and we get embryos that aren't uh, perhaps of the quality that we would expect. So a SCARSA test is fairly straightforward to do. Um, on a fresh sperm sample that the man brings in. Um, and we currently send ours down to a laboratory in Wellington for um, testing. Um, the cost is about four or $500. And what we're looking for is a um, DNA fragmentation percentage of under about 15 to 20%. And if it's more than that, um, then there is an association with increased risk of miscarriage and increased risk of poor outcomes with IVF. And I guess the good news is that you can do something about um, increased DNA fragmentation, um, primarily lifestyle um, change, which I'll talk about in a minute, and antioxidants. So oxidative stress occurs um, in the body when something called free radicals um, build up, and these can lead to cellular damage. Um, and antioxidants, which uh, are in preparations such as vitamins and men of it, um, Antioxidants are chemicals that are stable enough to, um, to basically balance the free radical and to neutralize it. Um, the evidence for the benefit of antioxidants is reasonable in men. Um, it's not absolutely, um, it's not absolutely um, overwhelming. And there's a big study recently um, suggesting that it has some benefit, but it may be less than we've previously thought. Um, but overall, there's reasonable evidence that if a man takes antioxidants for about three months um, prior to treatment, um, then that can improve outcomes. There isn't really the evidence for people who are spontaneously trying to get pregnant, but I think um, common sense is that if it improves, anti if it improves the DNA um, fragmentation, that it's likely to have some benefit. We'll also always recommend, of course, with that um, lifestyle modification, um, and that will include um, weight loss, 
um, if that's required. Um, Smoking is really important, and that includes marijuana. Um, there's been quite a few studies suggesting that marijuana can interfere with the parameters of the sperm, but there's also concern about the effect of um, marijuana um, that the father smokes um, on the developing baby, and particularly the baby's brain, um, and also the risk of childhood cancer. So um, there are quite a few reasons why, if you're trying to get pregnant, um, it's sensible um, not to smoke marijuana as well as tobacco. Excessive alcohol consumption um, is obviously another one. And when we when we take a history looking at occupation, uh, we'll focus particularly on exposure to industrial um, chemicals. People will often ask um, about mobile phones. And I think the current evidence is that there is no strong evidence that mobile phone use, um, particularly if you're largely holding it in your hand, um, impairs sperm significantly. But equally, I think if you are known to have a, a low sperm um, parameter, you're trying to get pregnant and experiencing difficulty in getting pregnant, then it probably is a good idea not to keep your mobile phone in your pocket. And it's probably a good idea to at least sort of try and mitigate um, that, even, even if it's a very small effect. In terms of the various treatments for um, male factor um, issues, um, in addition to the lifestyle advice that we would give, um, there are some surgeries available. So I mentioned varicocele before, which is this varicose vein in the scrotum. And that can be surgically treated reasonably simply either by embolization, which is blocking the vein, um, or by slightly more invasive surgery, but it's usually in and out the same day. And there's reasonably good evidence that um, the sperm uh, parameters, so that's the motility, the count, uh, will be improved with the repair of the varicocele. One of the problems, though, is that there aren't many good studies saying that the chance of getting pregnant naturally or with IVF are significantly improved with surgical correction of the varicocele. But in the last couple of years, there have been a couple of fairly small randomized control trials um, suggesting some benefit. So in men with significant varicoceles, we do currently advise them to have them um, repaired. Very occasionally, we'll pick up a problem um, with hormone production in the pituitary gland, um, and that can be helped with injections or, or sometimes tablets. Um, but quite often we can't actually improve um, a significantly low sperm count. We will occasionally find the complete absence of sperm, which is azoospermia, and that can be a mixture of a blockage or perhaps a complete failure of the testicle to produce sperm. Quite often there is sperm being produced, but there's not enough to show up in the ejaculate. And so what we can do is is surgical retrieval of sperm. So men quite often with no sperm in the ejaculate will end up having a testicular biopsy. Um, again, that's usually a pretty simple in and out procedure, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes, and we just take a tiny little piece of tissue. We can analyze it under a microscope and see if there is sperm production, and if there is, we can freeze some of the sperm. Uh, we do that reasonably commonly. In terms of surgery to unblock blockages, um, Often that's not very effective, um, other than perhaps for, for previous vasectomy. And we quite often get asked people who, who present with the regret of a vasectomy, um, should they have a vasectomy reversal or should they um, consider IVF? Generally, if the interval from the vasectomy is more than about 10 years, then IVF is probably more sensible. Uh, and that's partly based on um, the development of anti-sperm antibodies once the interval gets over about 10 years and also the chances of pregnancy. Also, the age of the woman will influence the decision about whether to have vasectomy reversal or go for IVF, because again, it can take at least a year for the sperm to be reasonable quality after a vasectomy reversal. And if you're concerned about age, um, you may not feel that you have that year. Probably the commonest treatments that we um, utilize are intrauterine insemination um, or IVF um, with microinjection. Just starting with intrauterine insemination, um, you can certainly do this where there's a mild impairment of the sperm parameters. 
um, but we would still want about um, five to seven million um, total motile sperm to have a pretty good chance of IUI working. Um, it's a lot simpler than IVF, um, but as I said, not, not suitable for all people. Um, and you do need normal tubes to be able to do it through your own insemination. Um, we'll quite often utilize IUI where there's a problem um, with erectile dysfunction that hasn't been able um, to be helped medically. Um, and under those circumstances where it's simply a failure of the sperm to get to the right place, IUI is very effective. In New Zealand, we quite often add in um, a tablet called clomiphene or letrozole um, when we're doing IUI just to op optimize ovulation. Um, but one of the problems obviously adding in clomiphene um, is there's a, is a risk of twins. Um, and it's a risk that we see less and less with IVF. In terms of IVF um, ICSI, um, microinjection really was a, a huge um, breakthrough in the mid 1990s. And it essentially involves injecting a sperm into an egg. And I've got a photo of it in a minute. Um, until ICSI came along in the mid 90s, we couldn't actually help a lot of couples where the sperm count was quite abnormal. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that you actually needed pretty normal sperm to do IVF. And so couples often chose donor insemination as an option when the sperm was really um, low. Um, and now microinjection means that we can help not all couples, but the majority. Um, and even if we just have to get sur sperm surgically from the testicle, um, then again, microinjection can be used um, for that. Um, donor insemination is still utilized occasionally. Um, so we see some couples where the man has absolutely no um, sperm production at all. It might be a chromosomal issue like um, Kleinfelter's syndrome. Um, there's a condition called Sertoli cell only where essentially the cells that produce the sperm are not present. Um, and donor insemination, again, um, can be a pretty successful treatment um, done uh, with intrauterine insemination. There is a problem um, with availability of sperm donors in New Zealand, and most of the clinics, unfortunately, have about a one-year wait um, if you need to use a clinic sperm donor. So clinics all the time are looking at strategies um, to try and address that shortage. I just wanted to give a very quick um, overview of IVF, which is utilized quite a lot for treating male factor infertility. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's got a lot simpler um, in the last 12 or 13 years. And part of the reason it's got a lot simpler is because of the introduction of the so-called short antagonist cycles. Um, so back in the 1980s and 1990s, um, IVF took a few extra weeks and we often had to do what was called down regulation. Um, where we literally turned the ovaries off and, and put them artificially briefly into the menopause. So the short antagonist cycle can start when you've got your period. Um, it's a daily injection for about a week to make as many follicles as is reasonable grow. Um, and then after a couple of scans, um, we add in a blocking drug to stop ovulation happening until we're ready um, to give what's called a trigger injection. And the eggs are harvested most of the time just under local anaesthetic with sedation in New Zealand with a vaginal um, scan. And then the, the eggs and the sperm are um, fertilized together. Um, most of the time, if it's a male factor, then ICSI, as I said, will be utilized. We ideally grow the fertilized eggs onto the fifth day um, to blastocyst stage. If there aren't enough to, um, to grow on, then we will do a day, what we call a day three transfer. Um, but our preference is to grow them on, and then any spare ones can be um, cryopreserved, can be frozen um, for future use, um, which is a huge bonus, um, getting obviously some extra um, frozen ones. Um, this slide just explains um, what's involved with microinjection. So um, the slide on my left um, is just showing the glass pipette um, about to suck the egg against it. Um, and you can see the needle up in the top corner, um, which is just in the process of um, drawing a, a sperm tail first. And then the other slide um, is showing that the 
um, the egg is being sort of held in position by a bit of suction on that glass pipette. And the needle's gone right through the outer membrane, um, the zona pellucida of the egg, and is about to deposit the sperm um, right into the cytoplasm. And as I said, that's been around since the 1990s and has really made a massive difference to um, the conditions that we can treat. Ballpark, about 50% of IVF cycles in New Zealand <clears throat> utilise um, microinjection. Um, we don't use it um, unless it's indicated or needed. Um, we'll occasionally recommend it for long-term unexplained infertility because we'll be concerned that when you've been trying for four or five years, there could be an underlying fertilization issue that hasn't been able to be diagnosed. So we can often do what's called a split if we get enough eggs. And so we'll, we'll fertilize some of them normally through IVF, just putting sperm and eggs together overnight. And then alternatively, um, we'll, with the other half of the split, um, we'll do microinjection. And then we can compare the two the next day and see whether um, going forward microinjection will be needed. Um, just a word about self-help. I've mentioned quite a lot of it already. Um, so exercise, we think, is, is really helpful. Um, you can probably over-exercise um, when you're trying to get pregnant, and that's in, in terms of not, um, not overheating yourself excessively um, on a daily basis. Um, healthy nutrition, healthy weight is sensible, um, and we've talked already about age. Stress is a difficult one because it's actually difficult to measure stress and it's difficult to measure um, the physiological effect on the body. It's something that people do worry about, um, you know, should they be taking time off work? Um, there's no scientific evidence that taking time off work makes a difference, certainly to treatment outcomes. Um, but clinics generally have um, um, strategies in place, including counselling for helping couples manage stress. Um, and obviously limiting alcohol and um, caffeine is sensible. You don't have to have no caffeine, um, one or two coffees a day, um, so long as it's limited as reasonable. I wanted to um, finish off just by saying something about the public funding, <clears throat> because it often um, is a source of confusion. Um, New Zealand spends about 15 or $16 million a year um, on government-funded tertiary treatment, and most of that's IVF, but not all of it includes some intrauterine insemination, um, some donor um, treatment. And unfortunately, at the moment, the waiting lists in most parts of the country um, are over 12 months. There are some exclusion criteria. So one of them is age. Um, women must be under the age of 40 um, at the time of referral into the system. Um, and an age criteria for men was introduced, um, I think, about three or four years ago, um, and that is that the men must be under the age of 55. And similarly, there's a weight criteria for, um, for females of 32, um, and again, one was introduced um, based on the evidence that I talked about, about the effect of male um, BMI on treatment outcomes, so male BMI must be under the age of 40. Both need to be non-smokers, um, but after three months cessation, um, patients can be enrolled. The comment about FSH um, is really just that <clears throat> if a woman wishes to use her own eggs for treatment, there must be a reasonable chance of, of response to the drugs. Um, and generally, if the FSH is over 15, this is the baseline FSH during a period, um, then we can predict that the ovarian response is likely to be quite limited. There's a clever blood test called AMH, which we also utilize a lot now, um, and that can actually be more useful than FSH in predicting um, possible response. In terms of getting enough points, which is 65 to go onto the waiting list, um, <clears throat> if you have a serious sperm problem, you'll get maximal points. So that would be a count of under um, you know, under 5 million per mil. If you've done three intrauterine inseminations for a mild male factor and not got pregnant, um, obviously you've got no sperm at all, then so long as you've been trying for more than 12 months and none of these other exclusion criteria um, apply, then you should qualify just about straight away. 
One of the problems, though, is if you don't have a serious sperm problem, if it's a mild sperm problem, then you either need to try for three or four years or have some other factors such as endometriosis or tubal um, to get enough points. So it can be quite complicated, but if you attend a fertility clinic um, for a consultation, one of the things that the specialist will go through with you is your eligibility. And if you're not eligible, um, approximately how long you're likely to have to wait. Um, if you have a child already, you can still qualify for public treatment. Um, but generally, you have to be trying for a minimum of three years if you already have a child, just because of the way the point scoring system works. Um, thank you very much. I mean, that's a, a fairly quick overview of um, male factor fertility. And as I said, um, about half of the people that we see have a, um, a male factor to a lesser or greater extent. Um, so it's obviously very important. Um, and, and getting a semen analysis done is one of the very first things that we do um, when we see people for assessment. I'm now happy to um, answer questions. Um, the first one um, is related to what do I recommend to try to lift the sperm count. Um, count is 4 million of stop smoking and BMI is fine. Um, I mean, as I said, um, if a varicocele has been excluded, and they can be quite tricky to diagnose, um, so if a varicocele has been excluded and um, you've been trying antioxidant preparations for a minimum of about three months, um, and, you've, and you've done the other lifestyle modification things, then, yeah, if the count stays down at about 4 million per mil, then... Um, IVF is likely to be required. We certainly wouldn't recommend intrauterine insemination um, at that level. Um, question about COVID vaccines affecting male infertility. Um, there's no evidence at this stage um, that there's any, any negative effect on male um, or female fertility. Um, and we're certainly going to be recommending to um, couples who are trying to get pregnant when the vaccine becomes available um, and um, they have the opportunity to get it, that they go ahead and, and do get it. Yeah, why do, why do some men find it embarrassing or refuse to get tested? Um, I mean, there's some interesting research um, from particularly the US looking at the psychological impact of infertility and men seem to be particularly affected um, when it's a male factor, whereas women seem to be affected um, no matter what the cause of the problem, so male and female. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, culturally also, um, um, in some cultures, it can be um, more difficult for men to be open about sperm issues. And certainly, we know that sperm donation um, and, and um, being open about sperm donation um, can be very difficult in some cultures. Um, in terms of what can you do, um, it's probably just important to talk about it and to try and um, understand what could be the issue. Um, some men... Are worried about actually producing the sample. Um, some of the community laboratories don't actually have a specialised um, private room that the men can use. So in some towns, they're pretty much obliged to produce them at home, which they may prefer to do. Um, but if there are travel issues involved, because the lab wants it within about 60 minutes of production, that can be pretty um, frustrating that some of them don't have local um, local facilities for producing one. All of the fertility clinics have a reasonably private um, room for producing sperm samples. And again, um, some men can be uncomfortable about that. It sometimes helps if they can, um, you know, have their partner with them. Um, but, you know, when, when you review what people complain about in, in attending fertility clinics, the sperm donation room and the the donation of the sperm is often um, one of the things that's raised. 
Um, my partner has a low sperm count and a high FSH. Does the high FSH matter? Um, so FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone. So men have it just as women do. So in women, um, it, it is responsible for making an egg grow. And as a woman approaches the menopause, the FSH starts to creep up <clears throat> because the brain recognizes that the ovary is not producing eggs properly. So it's in the same way if your thyroid's not working properly, um, you produce a bit more TSH. And that's one of the things that we measure in blood to see if your thyroid's working properly. In a man, if the FSH is reasonably high, that's the brain sensing that there's a problem with sperm production. Um, and it's a problem in the testicle with the sperms, with the sperm producing cells. If the if the FSH is very high um, and the testicle is small, um, then that's quite a concern. And there's a higher chance that when we do a biopsy, um, we won't find sperm. Um, we often still will go ahead with the biopsy because clearly that's a really important um, thing to make a decision on. But there's a there's a, there's a genetic blood test that we can do on men with a high FSH, um, particularly if the, if the sperm is absent. Um, um, it's called a microdelete, Y microdeletion test, and it's looking for an abnormality in the Y chromosome. And if there are certain microdeletions present, then that's a fairly predictable sign that there may be no sperm production. Um, I guess the good sign in this question is that the sperm is there, it's just low. Um, and yeah, there are, there are not really any effective ways to reduce the FSH because it's actually working. Um, it's, it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, which is sensing that the sperm production is low. What ox antioxidant supplement is recommended to increase sperm count and quality? Um, there's no one preparation that's better than the others. Um, a lot of the original research in Australia and New Zealand was done on the preparation that became Nenevit. Um, and that's probably about 15 years ago now. <clears throat> and quite simply, um, a study was done where a group of men whose partners were going through IVF um, were given for three months um, a mixture of zinc, selenium, um, some vitamins and folic acid and garlic and other antioxidants. Um, and, and then another group of men didn't take it, they took a placebo. And it was found that there were, um, there were better outcomes and more chance of getting pregnant um, in the group that took the antioxidant. So that was pretty compelling and got everyone pretty excited. The studies have been repeated, um, probably not with, um, not, not with the same um, degree of certainty. But as I mentioned earlier, there have been a couple of randomized control trials in the last couple of years suggesting um, some evidence of benefit, even though the evidence is fairly low. I think because it's pretty simple to do and relatively inexpensive, um, and there is some benefit of evidence, I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, but it kind of is watch the space a bit, and there are further studies underway. Is there a way to increase the sperm count of 8 million with diet or not at all? Um, well, yes, there is. So lifestyle modification, particularly if it's um, reducing alcohol or reducing um, BMI if you're significantly overweight, um, absolutely can make a difference. And again, it would matter. It would make a difference about whether the sperm counts a bit variable or not, or whether it's always um, reasonably low. Um, so that shows the importance of getting um, several tests done. Um, recently read hot spa use three consecutive days will reduce male infertility. Any comment? Um, our general advice to people who are either trying to get pregnant and, and having a delay or where they know there's a, a, a reduction in the sperm parameters, our advice would be to avoid overheating. And, you know, I think you could jump into a spa for five or 10 minutes. That's probably fine. But I would not sit in a spa for 30 minutes or 60 minutes for three consecutive days. Um, there were some studies back 25 years ago looking at whether wearing loose fitting boxes as opposed to um, tighter underwear um, made a difference. And in fact, the study suggested they probably didn't. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would avoid 
I, I would avoid um, the possibility of overheating in a spa. Now, my partner has a high sperm count but low motility. Pop qualify for public funding, but in the meantime, are there any supplements such as men of it? Um, yeah, I mean, the antioxidants have um, have been demonstrated to improve parameters in some people. Again, um, one of the causes of low motility could be a varicocele, which is you know not always simple to identify. So probably just worth checking that an examination's been done in the last 12 months or so. And if there's any doubt about it, then a scrotal ultrasound um, should pick up whether there's a significant varicocele or not. Um, the causes of azoospermia and can it be fixed? Um, varicocele embolization procedure and pre and post revealed no sperm. Yeah, so um, the commonest causes of azoospermia that we see um, would either be um, a congenital blockage of the vas, which is obviously the tube that carries the sperm to the outside. So we test um, in men with no sperm for um, cystic fibrosis gene mutation. Um, so these men don't have cystic fibrosis, which is a disease that affects um, the lungs and the pancreas. Um, but clearly the cystic fibrosis gene mutation is right next to the genes that are responsible for the normal VAS to grow. And so these men have a, a functional blockage. Um, the good news is that sperm can be obtained surgically pretty simply. There isn't really an operation to rejoin it. Um, it's actually not that common to see men with a blockage from infection. Um, so you may have heard of chlamydia um, and gonorrhea, which are sexually transmitted diseases. But although they're reasonably common in the community, um, we don't commonly see men with a blockage caused by that, but we have seen some. The commonest cause of azoospermia um, is that there is a problem with the um, cells that produce the sperm. Um, quite often we can actually find a small number of sperm by doing a biopsy, and we can help those men with IVF and microinjection. Um, but if there's an underlying chromosomal issue, such as I mentioned Kleinfelter syndrome, um, or if the man's been born um, with the sperm cells actually just not present or functioning, then um, we can't assist that. There is research underway looking at can you fertilize an egg um, using a um, you know a cell that isn't a germ cell you know, that's going to produce a sperm and um, that's probably possible a long time into the future but it isn't possible currently. Um, can a normal gynecologist help with male infertility or is it best to go to a fertility clinic? I can't go myself as my BMI is high. Um, so, generally speaking, um, if you've got a fertility issue, you're better off seeing a, um, uh, a gynecologist with an interest in fertility. So, a small number of us are actually what we call subspecialists in infertility, um, but there's quite a few gynecologists around with an interest in fertility. Um, in terms of your comment about your B BMI being high, um, at the moment, certainly in the northern region, which is Auckland and Northland, um, you can actually get access for a clinic appointment if your BMI is, if the woman's BMI is under 40. Um, some GPs um, aren't aware of that, but the rules got changed a bit so that at least you can still come and be assessed and get some information about what might be wrong. And um, even if you're not yet eligible for treatment because of the BMI, um, there's the opportunity to um, have an assessment, yeah. So yeah, my, my recommendation generally would be to go to a fertility um, specialist in a fertility clinic. Um, generally, no, freezing sperm doesn't um, damage sperm. Um, so donor programs, for instance, have been around since the 1970s or 80s. Um, I think the technology and the the way it's been done has got a bit better um, but it's really had pretty good sperm survival rates um, for a long time and there's no evidence that um, that using thawed out sperm um, has any increased um, significantly increased risk of um, chromosome or gene problems in the offspring 
Um, there's a small number of people where um, fresh sperm is better. So not all, not all sperm freezes well. Um, we do quite often do what's called, called a, a post-freeze thaw where we will um, unfreeze a little bit of the sperm that's just been frozen just to check that the motility is still reasonable. Um, but generally freezing sperm is um, a very, very safe and reasonable thing to do. And we do it quite often where there are concerns about the availability of the man on the day, for instance, because of work or travel commitments. Um, and some men are worried about being able to produce a sample um, on the day um, under some pressure. And so they'll freeze a sample as a backup. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. And um, uh, we've obviously been using sperm freezing for a long time for the donor sperm program. Um, similarly, there's pretty good evidence now that freezing eggs um, is becoming a pretty reliable thing to be able to do in terms of subsequently unfreezing them and fertilizing them. That Hi. looks like all of the questions uh, for tonight. Yep. So thank you so much, Dr. Guy Goodex of Repromed for uh, taking time this evening and sharing your expertise with with everyone. We really appreciate it. And thank you, you for everybody, um, to everybody for joining us, uh, joining us tonight. All right. Thank Thanks you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Good night. Poor Maria.